Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, participating in our special seminar series today. And uh, we are very happy to have Professor Lou Wei from California Institute of Technology. And briefly, Dr. Lu obtained her PhD from Columbia University working with Professor Wei Min. Too fascinated by the stimulated Raman sketching microscopy, she decided to stay at Columbia, continuing her postdoctoral work on developing new nonlinear vibrational imaging techniques. Dr. Lu joined the faculty at Caltech in 2018. And Lu has recently been recognized by the 2017 ACS Physics Division Young Investigator Award, Blavatnik Regional Awards for Young Scientists, Amgen Early Innovator Award, and 2020 uh, NIH Director's New Innovator Award. And today she's gonna talk about high resolution multiplex chemical imaging in cells and tissues. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Lu. Thanks a lot um, for the kind introduction, Ahmed, and, and thanks for inviting me um, to be a part of this exciting spatial omics seminar series. So today I uh, hope to um, tell share with you a little bit of our thoughts of uh, pushing Rama microscopy toward high resolution, uh, highly multiplex chemical imaging platform toward spatial omics applications in cells and tissues. And I hope to do so by sharing with you uh, three short stories that we are currently working on um, in our lab. So as spatial omics fans, we all know the importance of uh, being able to perform imaging for uh, a retrieving uh, rich biological information in biomedicine, um, ranging from the um, whole body scale imaging toward more uh, toward those um, modalities in operating in the optical range that offers a high subcellular resolution, uh, high subcellular spatial resolution, such as a fluorescence microscopy. Um, we have seen um, the, the information driven um, um, discoveries for our understanding in biomedicine. And for those uh, um, techniques operating in the optical range, uh, such as a, pop a popular fluorescence microscopy, the development and applications is also largely driven by the innovation in the groundbreaking um, inventions, such as uh, in, uh, fluorescent, green, green fluorescent proteins or super resolved fluorescence microscopy. In our lab, we work with we work on another optical spectral microscopy techniques um, that we're trying to develop uh, um, new. Um, platforms that could address certain limitations in fluorescence and come up with complementary um, informations um, to allow us to uh, to fluorescence and to allow us to perform um, a retrieve information um, that was uh, invisible before. So we do so by employing um, Raman uh, scattering um, from molecular vibrations. So if you take a Rama spectrum from a mammalian cell, you're going to see this uh, characteristic Rama peaks showing up. Um, those were originating from the unique vibrational motions of chemical bonds in the, in the endogenous molecular species inside cells. For example, the methyl groups uh, from proteins, um, methylene group reached in lipids, and also uh, the characteristic peaks from uh, amino acids and DNA. But you may wonder um, why Rama is not so popular for bioimaging yet. Well, it's getting pop more popular. It's because compared to the highly sensitive fluorescence, uh, Rama scattering is a, is, a, is a quite weak process. So um, for a long time, its um, um, sensitivity has been limited to um, a very high threshold. Um, that's uh, it's not very applicable for low um, concentration uh, analysis in biological samples. So to address the limitation issue, uh, stimulated Raman scattering, we call it SRS, has been proven to be a more applicable and ideal strategy for a biomedical uh, microscopy techniques um, for cells and tissues. This utilizes this Einstein stimulant emission principle that could facilitate the relatively weak Raman transition by about eight order of magnitude through uh, supplying additional laser for stimulant emission process. While this phenomenon was um, um, discovered um, back in 1962, 
um, its application as an implementation as a, a biomedical microscopy technique was only um, came, only came around um, in uh, around 2008. So the way we um, set up the SRS micro microscope is by um, supplying two lasers, one we call pump and Stokes lasers. They're pulsed lasers and um, spatially and temporally aligned. So by combining them and send them into the microscope and tune their um, frequency difference, energy difference between pump and Stokes to ma match with the vibrational transition of your moment of interest or chemical bond of interest, then the stimulant Raman excitation could facilitate the transition of uh, um, the this, uh, vibrational transition from the ground state to the excited state. So as the mo molecules are being excited to the vibrational excited state, one pump photon would the energy of pump photon would be transferred into this excitation energy plus one Stokes photon. So the net effect is whenever you have a stimulant transition going on, you lose one pump photon, we call it a stimulant loss, and you gain one Stokes photon, we call it stimulant gain. By filtering out the Stokes laser and detecting the pump photon with a large area photo diode, we can detect the uh, Ram Raman loss signal that is corresponds to the stimulant transition in cells. And by um, raster scanning the laser across the samples, you can generate a nice um, a chemical map as a stimulant imaging. So on the right, I just uh, show how the microscope looks like in our lab. Okay. So now you are detecting a signal on top of a laser, right? So you are detecting laser intensities. Um, to reduce the laser fluctuation, a high frequency modulation transfer scheme would be ideal um, that uh, utilizes a high frequency modulator to um, modulate Stokes beam at a, a megahertz and then detect the, the stimulant loss signal um, exactly on, on the same uh, modulation uh, uh, frequency using a locking amplifier detection. So in this way, we can push the detection into the shunt moments limited high frequency region and do the, um, uh, do the detection upon a very quiet uh, noise floor uh, to allow highly sensitive uh, SRS imaging. With that, SRS has a demonstrated imaging down to micromolar range um, for um, uh, uh, biomolecules in, in live cells and tissues. So in, a, in addition to performing mapping of chemical bonds in, inside life, life biological systems, we can also retrieve the rich chemical information through a hyperspectral SRS microscopy. So in that way, you are essentially generating a chemical spectrum at each pixel and, 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 and throughout the whole image. So there are a couple of ways you can do it. Um, but the two typical ways are you can use a, a picosecond laser um, which matches with the uh, um, uh, narrow line, Raman line width through the spectral, uh, spectral resolution. And, and we call it a, a bound selective SRS, because in this way, uh, if once the wavelengths of the two pump, uh, pump and stokes being determined, you are targeting a known peak, Raman peak from, for a known uh, chemical bond of interest. So if you want to ma uh, map out map out the spectral information that we can do in the, by fast tuning the wavelengths across different wave number so that we can generate a hyperspectral image with a spectral resolution, the spectral information. You can also do this through a femtosecond laser uh, excitation scheme um, that you can use a, a femtosecond laser um, as a pump and stokes. Uh, which are the laser essentially used for two photon fluorescence microscopy, uh, of course, at, with additional Stokes output. And then through um, the optical chirping, um, you can um, transfer this um, uh, spectral over, spectral uh, over uh, you can transfer this uh, sp uh, temporal overlap into the spectral information um, through the spectral uh, uh, through spectral focusing um, uh, of a, a femtosecond laser. So in this way, the, the spectral focusing SRS utilizing femtosecond would allow you to generate a faster um, spectral scanning, um, but at a, at, a, at a slight sacrifice of a spectral resolution and sensitivity. So determ 
de um, depending on what's the application, um, there, um, these are the two major choice of, of uh, implementation schemes. So these are some general backgrounds about SRS. Then what is SRS good for? Of course, it's very good for label-free chemical imaging that we can j just target the chemical bonds, chemical information from endogenous molecules and map those peaks, target on those peaks and map the distribution of those chemical species, such as uh, lipid proteins, as I said, amino acids, DNA, without any labeling. Uh, we can also do this for other small metabolites, right, including glucose um, neurotransmitters. Well, that has been demonstrated by other groups. And the advantage compared to the use of a large flow of work is that this is highly non-invasive, non-perturbative, especially when your molecule of interest are small metabolites. Those are freely moving around and easily perturbed by uh, tagging of a large molecule, uh, large flow for tagging. So this, um, in fact, since the invention of SRS imaging, um, label-free scheme has primarily been the, um, the implementation implementation uh, schemes for SRS. However, there's a reason that you like fluorescence, right? Especially you like flow for tagging because it gives you high sensitivity and a specificity. So using a tag, you can also give you a better resolvability in terms of attacking specificity. So encouraged by that, we and others also um, uh, demonstrated a um, SRS imaging scheme with a minimum labeling strategy by utilizing the small and a bioorthogonal and spectral spectroscopically orthogonal vibrational tags. They're essentially just a chemical bonds, such as carbon deuterium bond or carbon carbon triple bond, which are bioorthogonal and mi minimum perturbation and have this uh, spectrum in the uh, cell silent bioorthogonal region. So for carbon deuterium, the spectrum is broader. For all kinds of very uh, sharp and, and single peak. So with that, you can tag, tag your molecule of interest, metabolites of interest with a carbon deuterium or carbon or triple bond, and then fit them, replace the, indole, replace the regular form, the hydrogen form of metabolites with the deuterative form, and then fit them into the cell medium as a because there are building blocks, their cells are going to take them and incorporate into um, their um, macromolecules to um, uh, to uh, for the for the normal biological processes. As a stable isotope, especially for carbon deuterium, is highly non-invasive because uh, the cells really cannot differentiate the carbon deuterium to carbon hydrogen unless they're trying to break those bonds. But, so in this way, using deuterated amino acids, we can monitor the uh, protein synthesis activities over time, or the distribution of newly synthesized proteins um, in a spatial de temporal dependent manner in neurons and then in, also in brain tissues to identify those spatial hotspots. Similar uh, 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 strategies could be applied to deuterating fatty acid, glucose, choline, or deuterium oxide, oxide, that you can use them as a tracers for metabolic activities to understand and study cellular metabolism. Can also feed this as food to mouse or inject them into mouse to uh, to do it in, in the animal level. Similar things has been uh, we have demonstrated using alkyne, which is a very popular um, biophotogram handle for click chemistry. In this way, we can bypass the later click step and directly image the alkyne vibration from this uh, tagged small metabolites and to understand their um, metabolic um, uh, uptake synthesis and conversion through a broad, broad uh, spectrum of uh, metabolites. Um, of course, we can also uh, derivatize the alkyne with uh, isotope addition that would allow us to perform multi highly multiplexed uh, um, uh, imaging, well, not highly yet, but multiplex imaging for um, um, different species of metabolites. Okay, so with that, um, you, I have, you can see that by targeting the label-free channel, um, SRS is really good for quantitative analysis, mapping of chemical compositions in cells, utilizing those characteristic Raman peaks. And using this deuterated or alkyne um, tagged, um, not highly non-invasive scheme, we can use them to track the synthesis 
conversion, transportation, and even degradation of the, each of the metabolic processes in, um, of interest. We can also use the spectral tracing through um, the, the, the change of Raman signatures to, uh, to, to especially trace the conversion of metabolites as they go into the, um, into the cells and being uh, transformed into other uh, building blocks inside the cells. So to take this up, uh, uh, sort of a step further, we want to explore whether we can use Rama as a effective um, cellular metabolomics tools, um, especially uh, uh, by using Rama alone or by combining Rama into other uh, spatial omics techniques to draw uh, meaningful uh, correlations. So guided by this rationale, we team up with uh, Professor Jim Heath who was at Caltech and now at the Institute of System Biology, trying to apply Raman as a subcellular pharmacometabolomics tools um, for metastatic melanoma cells. So we adopted a panel of patient-derived melanoma cell, cancer cells that um, and randomly selected a few um, as, our, as our analysis set that um, um, are defined by their gene expression um, profile um, ranging from uh, toward more monocytic phenotype to uh, more of a mesenchymal phenotype. So through a unsupervised statistic analysis on spectrum and also on the SRS imaging of live cells um, targeting the CH2 and CH3 channel, which um, is um, attributed to the lipid and the protein distributions, we found that very uh, interesting a decay of, of a lipid to protein ratios across different phenotypes. We also try to map this into uh, the gene expression um, database and also use this as a gene enrichment score to correlate with the, um, the uh, 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 different um, uh, transcription uh, pathways. We found high correlations with both uh, lipid related genes and also um, one high, extremely high correlation with uh, gene ontology fatty acid biosynthetic pathways. So this indicates us that the, what the phenomena we saw on the single cell level are likely attributed to the, um, bio, uh, the, the fatty acid biosynthetic uh, 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 processes. So then we use the correlative live cell assays using deuterated uh, lipids, deuterated fatty acids, and also as an uptake assay and a deuterated glucose as a transformation assay to assay the de novo fatty acid synthesis using the, um, by tracing the carbon deuterium transformation. We confirm that, that this uh, decrease of uh, uh, lipid to protein ratio in um, uh, uh, different phenotypes indeed could be correlated to the de novo fatty acid synthesis. We quantified this and then um, also confirmed that this, the inhibiting the de novo synthesis could serve as an effective metabolic susceptibility toward the differentiated cell types, more um, uh, melanocytic phenotypes. So this really is a First, a step for us to correlate um, the, our Raman spectral um, and spatial information with the uh, gene transcription um, information. However, our interest was really in uh, subcellular level. We want to generate subcellular spectrum and to correlate this exactly to the, um, or, uh, the omics information, um, ideally at a single cell level, but but um, uh, that's our, what we're working on here is on the bulk level. So guided by this rationale, we in generated the uh, hyperspectral SRS on um, this uh, different phenotype of cells and, um, and analyzed the, the spectrum specifically. Also, this is a hyperspectral SRS data set. And we analyzed this specifically to the lipid droplets um, because they have been no implicated in in the in, in the cancer progression and has been proven as an important uh, uh, organelles um, mediating the energy um, storage and transfer. So we indeed found that um, this uh, mycenchymal phenotype, which is supposedly been notorious for uh, accounting for the failure of uh, therapy in melanoma um, cancer therapies, um, has much higher regular 
much higher storage of unsaturated lipids from the lipid droplet. Well, our first question we ask is whether what we observe at subcellular level could is responsible, could account for uh, the, the, the change at the whole cell level. So we did the mass spec um, analysis of fatty acids in the bulk level. We, and the results puzzled us for a while because we didn't see it any of the obvious trend of increase of, unsatur of unsaturation at the whole cell level, particularly to the uh, mycin phenotype cells. It was an, only until we did lipidomics with the retained chemical, uh, with the retained lipid species information that we started to have some insight on this. So you see that the, indeed, there are two species that has a significantly higher unsaturated fatty acid ratios in the, um, the mycinchemo phenotype cells that are uh, triacylglyceride and a, and a, and a uh, uh, cholesterol ester. And the total lipid composition is only less than 6% of the total lipids in cells. That's why what we saw in, is uniquely from the lipid droplets, but not shown in the bulk level. And we're really excite, excited by that uh, specially selected uh, information because that's the beauty of the way of, 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 of performing spatial analysis, right? So later, correlated with um, uh, drug inhibition assay, viability assay, and the uh, time lapse apoptotic assay, and uh, uh, with uh, also with uh, lipidomics, we pinpointed that um, um, this um, uh, inhibiting a, a monounsaturase could serve as an effective. Um, uh, 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 metabolic susceptibility for the um, methanchemo phenotype, and only by inhibiting the monounsaturase, not the polyunsaturase. And this inhibition process is, uh, is primarily uh, comes from the conversion of steric acid to oleic acid through lipidomic anal analysis. What's, what's more interesting to us as a microscopy um, fans is that we also observed by inhibiting the cells, the cancer cells, with this monodesaturase inhibitor, we observed that there's a formation of phase separated me membrane structures that are resistant to the detergent, the triton wash, the detergent wash. You see that regular um, um, phase, um, the lip, uh, phase, the membrane structures in control cells or cells treated with monounsaturase inhibitor all being washed away from the from same set of cells on top and the, the bottom. And by treating the de, um, desaturase, they form this tightly packed and phase separated membrane structures um, that is simultaneous with the onset of this uh, uh, apoptosis process. Well, we did more analysis, but because of the time limit, I'm going to skip a little bit uh, through rescue uh, assays and uh, a vib together with viability assays and then the um, um, lipidomics uh, with uh, cells, control cells and cells treated with uh, monounsaturase. We were able to piece together a very a possible, uh, we cannot say 100% yet, but very likely a, metabol a cellular metabolic uh, control picture that this uh, uh, mesenchymal phenotypes, um, they have, although they have very minimum uh, de novo lipid synthesis, they once they synthesize lipids, they they are more uh, they're higher in unsaturated level and their uh, uh, storage in this in the lipid droplet. Uh, we think they're likely to be able, uh, to maintain the high fluidity and migration uh, nature of the cells. And once we inhibit the uh, monounsaturase, the key monounsaturase um, um, uh, uh, proteins, um, enzymes, we, then we are basically blocking the um, transformation of a saturated fatty acid to unsaturated fatty acid. Once we do that, the cells will release unsaturated fatty acids from the droplets to compensate for the loss of fluidity, for loss of the balance. Um, that's why I didn't say it, but we have been observed the lagging kinetics in our uh, uh, apoptosis assay. Well, and eventually, when this becomes this uh, um, unbalance becomes terminal, that unsaturated fatty acids is being generated too much, and the unsaturated fatty acids is not enough. The cells will form this uh, highly packed um, phase separated membrane domains. Because the cells, they also not only synthesize less, they also they also uptake 
a lot less um, oleic acid from the environment, well, the unsaturated fatty acid uh, from the environment has a buffer. So with that, we also pinpointed, um, together with transcriptomics, also pinpointed a, 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 the pathways, the gene expression pathways, and uh, kappa B, that's together with the susceptibility that we're trying to figure out um, the cor exact correlation uh, currently. So this concludes, I hope I'm not taking too long, but this concludes the first part of my story that I'm hoping I have convinced you that Raman with the rich chemical information could be a um, unique uh, life cell based uh, pharmacometabolomics tools um, that could be drawing meaningful information when um, correlated with uh, the current omics techniques. Of course, we, ideally, we hope that we can be able to generate this uh, um, correlative Rama and trans and omics transcriptomics lipidomics information from the same single cell level. So that's something hopefully uh, we will be able to die in an, an, uh, in the near future. So then this goes into my second story that I'm hoping to um, tell you a little bit more on the structural imaging using SRS towards spec uh, toward the molecular uh, structure and the molecular profiling um, in the high resolution region. Okay. So while SRS is an optical technique that offers subcell resolution about with about 400 nanometer resolution, it's still we want to have much higher resolution, right? That's a, especially intrigued by the current uh, uh, information you can see um, by the super resolved fluorescence microscopy. So in order to perform a, a super resolution uh, Rama microscopy, um, actually this, there has been extensive efforts toward the skull, especially in the label free region. While the uh, stru structural illumination or excitation saturation or using a steam emission um, with a decoherence beam, um, has been very elegantly um, demonstrated uh, toward Rama imaging. Um, its, it, its application for biological systems are quite limited um, due to um, the required of a, a relatively high power and, 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 and also the signal um, issues. So we want to take a slightly different approach to, to, to tackle this question uh, through the recent um, um, very uh, advantages from the uh, sample expansion strategies. So our idea is actually simple to start with. We want to um, hybridize our sample with a hydrogel and then through um, the protocols from expansion microscopy of protease digestion and then expansion, we can image the retained proteins on the, net, on the hydrogel network by targeting the CH3 vibration, which is the, the methyl group vibration in the label free protein channel. Okay. However, our first uh, tr initial trials are, are, are not very successful. We kept seeing the uh, very dark images with not enough signals. This is because using the, the protease-based di digestion, we are um, eliminating, digesting a lot of protein fr fragments away. This is not an issue for fluorescence as you retain the epitope, but it's a significant issue for SRS as our signals primarily comes from how much proteins you can retain, right? So, um, well, the best thing for once you run into the issue is you can go back to the literature. So we started to read different um, expansion related literature and we, we found that, well, protease is not the only way. Of course, we tried other um, protease, uh, a, a lot of uh, different alternatives and, 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 and lower the time. Still, we would have issues into the uh, isotopic, isotropic expansion if we um, reduce the condi conditions. But then by reading, a few, uh, by reading other literatures, we found that if we, while well, we can add um, a exceeding amount of acre, acre amide into the um, uh, uh, fix, fixation solution so that you can quench the cross-linking induced by PFA. Um, in that way, you can we can utilize the, um, the protein denature as a homogenate to homogenize the sample instead of protease digestion, and then we can expand the sample, retaining most of the proteins that would give us a nice CH signals um, from the retained proteins to map high resolution. Um, 
label free SS um, uh, imaging. So that worked, and we were able to achieve nice um, intracellular uh, cytosolic structures with fine resolutions and also the membrane protrusions um, from philopodias um, from the total all retained proteins um, from cellular structures. And we were able to do this with effective resolution down to 91 nanometer and with higher NA objective we also demonstrated 78 nanometer um, in cell levels. Well, only in cells, we can also do this in tissues. So this is a um, expanded um, and the label-free map, SRS mapped um, hippocampal region of a brain tissue. We call this a expansion and the label-free imaging um, that give a very nice name as VISTA um, for vibrational imaging of swallow well, tissue and analysis. And, and we were very amazed by this higher contrast we were able to get. So now, we can, by looking more closely at the structures we were able to uh, obtain, we can obtain the very nice contrast from the, from the cell bodies, nuclei, processes, and also likely the um, blood vessels. So with all of this nice contrast, we are not satisfied with the contrast only, we want the information. Well, to do that, well, uh, before I, we also, um, we also got some very very small structures that are below the sub, uh, below the diffraction limit. Uh, we're still looking into those uh, structures, which are likely from the previous literature, likely the uh, synapses. But we're still investigating that. Um, in addition to X and Y resolution, we can also get very uh, good Z depth the volumetric imaging because now the sample becomes transparent. So we can really perform super resolution, deep tissue volumetric and label free imaging. So that's, we have a very long title for a paper. Okay, so that goes back to my earlier point. We're not satisfied with the structure. We want to get more information. So to do so, we need, really need specificity. So we did correlative fluorescence and the VISTA imaging on the expanded samples trying to see what exactly are those structures we're looking at. And we did indeed confirmed by um, a fluoresce correlated fluorescence imaging, we confirmed that those are uh, indeed the nice uh, blood vessel structures um, and the, even the, uh, likely the artery structures with uh, red, blood, uh, red blood cells. Um, we can, we have captured all the nuclease not only the nucleus from the uh, normal uh, the, the uh, neuronal cells and also the uh, nucleus co-localized with lactins we come from the by immunostaining in their uh, uh, um, uh, endothelial cells. All of the uh, cell bodies we captured, they are from matured neurons. So it turns out that matured neurons seems to have higher abundance in proteins in the cytosols, uh, in, in the cytoplasma. So we were able to see a higher uh, structures from the neutral neurons and also the come from those processes by the MAP2 staining. Now with, we have trained our brain, human brain very well of how to identify the structures using fluorescence our correlative guidance. We ask whether we can train the machine to do so. Um, then we can really get high specificity in a label-free fashion um, and utilizing the, the power from machine. So we indeed obtained uh, a, a Vista images, stacks and stacks of Vista images with correlative uh, um, fluorescence staining as a ground truth and did um, adopted a recent uh, reported UNET architecture to do the knurling. And these are the predicted results getting from our Vista image with fluorescence and ground truth. And, 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 and we got very high uh, Pearson's correlation um, from the uh, predicted uh, structures. So with this machine learning approach, now we can transform a originally single channel SRS image now into a multi-channel uh, image with, uh, for, for the uh, structure analysis with high specificity. So in a label-free way, we can generate the um, Vista nerd DAPI map to lactin and UN um, uh, by the by the uh, label for S uh, S3 S uh, Vista. And if we want to know have more, we can 
correlate this with fluorescence and add a couple of more channels by using fluorescence staining. So here we added uh, the GFAP for the um, astrocytes and, and, and the MBP for the um, uh, myelin and also the oligodendrocytes. So I think um, this approach, the advantage of this approach would really be if we want to um, perform um, a larger volume or a large volume sample analysis, and especially when we have a limited samples and a limited antibodies, we want uh, we need to stay, um, and we want to get this with much higher throughput because for tissue imaging, most of the times you are limited by the um, uh, antibody penetration into the tissues. So this is uh, just one example I'm showing with how inhomogeneous penetration you have. Um, especially if you want to do high, uh, highly multiplex imaging inside the tissues. So to showcase our further apply and showcase our technique, we applied the uh, VISTA into an analyzing protein aggregates in uh, cells and tissues. Um, and this uh, um, for the neurodegenerative uh, uh, diseases. So this we outline our, um, our pipeline of work for the VISTA. Uh, we also got a cover, a nice cover for the analyst um, uh, journal. So we first confirmed that um, expansion is really compatible for it and analyzing uh, protein aggregates um, by uh, using still using correlated fluorescence um, before and after expansion. We also confirm uh, that the um, uh, expansion is isotropic, especially now we're considering the tissue and also the the uh, um, hypothetically very dense um, aggregates. So we confirm that the strategy indeed works using sample, sample expansion. And we were able to get this nice fiber structures, fiber, fiber fibral structures with um, subcellular um, um, uh, thickness, uh, subdiffraction sub thickness um, from the 5X FAD mouse uh, brain uh, with, uh, with A beta plaques. So with that, we can use label-free VISTA to perform molar metric, um, a plaque, a beta plaque mapping. And especially we can, in particular, we can analyze it's a, it's a core and a, a aggregation core and also the diffusive, more diffusive fibrillar structures around the core. Interestingly, we did found several different phenotypes um, corresponding to different core shell structures of the uh, aggregation core and the diffusion shells um, with a correlative uh, uh, Congo rat staining. Well, we apply the same uh, machine learning tricks to um, the uh, uh, amino the beta um, uh, study and, we, and found that um, we can indeed um, perform uh, the subtyping of uh, a beta structure, st uh, the tissue structures surrounding the, um, the A beta plaques and also the a, for the A beta core shell structure itself. Our preliminary data also showed that um, the um, A beta plaques, they indeed have different core shell structures more, for, for example, this one has a more dotted like structures and this one is shows a more fibrillar structures. And those different structures also associated with very likely different morphology of the astrocytes that um, could likely correlate to the different activation levels of, of the astrocytes. And that's something we're also currently investigating to, to see how we can further utilize this uh, VISTA technique to do uh, subtyping for the uh, A-beta uh, plaques in the 5X uh, FAD mouse tissues. Okay, so in terms of pushing the VISTA to be, to be more relevant to spatial omics, Another thing we're trying to um, attain is to increase the sensitivity for SRS imaging. In this way, we hope that we will be able to capture more protein contents that are currently below our detection limit. In, and then we can offer more multiplex, even higher multiplex um, channels, in the, even uh, just from the label-free um, uh, images. So hopefully we can make that happen. All right, so that concludes the second part of my talk. In the third part, I, also, I, I want to um, share with you some of the efforts using, I'm um, sorry, some of the, some of the, of the efforts use of uh, developing 
um, effective and high sensitivity Raman dyes, just like the development of fluorescent dyes with, with, uh, with good quantum yield, good brightness, that would allow us to perform highly sensitive and highly multiplex optical imaging in uh, cells and tissues. Well, again, as special omics fans, we know, all know the importance of performing very multiplex, highly multiplex images, um, not only for genomics, but also for other molecular profilings for um, uh, metabolites for proteins, right? When the one, um, the so-called color barrier in fluorescence is the broad bandwidth for absorption and emission spectrum that limits how many colors you can obtain in the optical region, even with um, uh, post-processing of uh, spectral, uh, spectral separation. As a comparison, one unique advantage of Rama is the Rama peak is extremely narrow. It's about 50 to 100 times narrower compared to a single floor uh, absorption and emission peak from a floor floor. So in that case, in theory, Rama should be able to perform 50 or 100 times more multiplexity compared to fluorescence, just uh, due to this narrow ba bandwidth, right? So, and that's something we want to exploit. Of course, to do so, we need to have higher sensitivity first, so that we can get cover more um, um, uh, molecular targets in cells. So we um, proposed to do this um, to be uh, compatible for biological bio biomolecular targeting, uh, utilizing an electronic pre-resonance SRS imaging approach. So in this approach, we propose to um, use red absorbing molecules as our effective Raman probes. And because when you have absorption closer to our near infrared laser, which is around one micron, and to be more com to be compatible uh, for, for deep tissue and also uh, life cell imaging, then this uh, closer, bringing closer of the electronic um, energy to our pump and Sox laser uh, energy, would invoke this um, pre-resonance Rama effect. And by only bringing them together close, but not exactly um, exciting the, the, uh, on, on, the, on, the absorption, on the absorption peak, um, that's why it's called only called pre-resonance, not the resonance as fluorescence excitation. We're only benefiting from the high signal enhancement from resonance Raman, but not really exciting the molecular transitions. So we are still good on the photo bleaching. So by utilizing an electronic pre-resonance SRC uh, effect, we can now achieve nanomolar sensitivity. So Raman can be used to image the um, low, low abundance of molecular targets by uh, using the red absorbing dye labeling, but targeting the Raman vibration from the dyes, not, not the emission from the dyes. And, uh, and the advantage for that is the high, the fine chemical selectivity from the narrow Raman bandwidth. Okay, so if we tune the pump laser by just two nanometers away, you can see that the signal is completely gone, and this is due to this very narrow bandwidth of Raman. And the comparison, if you do this for fluorescence, you would pretty much see the similar signals, right? So with that, um, I we collaborated, teamed up with um. Uh, uh, organic chemist and we came up with this um, um, dye palette we call it a, a, a Mars dye because at the time it's Columbia so this is a for Manhattan Raman scattering dyes um, with um, this uh, um, triple bond conjugated to the absorbing red absorbing dye core of the of, of the red, red absorbing molecules with additional isotope addition, we can generate um, a total of a 24 color uh, Raman palette, Mars Raman palette, uh, dye palette for um, highly multiplex imaging. So this is a one application for a neuron co-cultures that we can use a Raman, uh, a highly multiplex the um, progressive Raman dyes to label cells, uh, tubing, uh, mature neuron from new N, GFAP, uh, and nesting for the um, uh, stem cells and also MBP for um, um, uh, oligodendrocytes. We can also couple this with additional Raman colors to assay the metabolic activity of uh, newly synthesized DNA and uh, proteins with this leveraging this multi-channel um, protein, uh, protein uh, imaging uh, using um, uh, antibody labeling. 
of course, we can do this in tissues. And, and then because um, it, our Rama is also com compatible with lifestyle imaging, we can also perform this in uh, live cells toward um, specially resolved um, organo, uh, uh, organelle interactions. Well, later, um, uh, led, uh, uh, led by my colleagues at Columbia, we also developed uh, this uh, highly multiplexed uh, poly ion, so conjugated alkyne based carbo palette that will similarly allow us to perform highly multiplexed uh, images on, in live cells and tissues. So recently, this is a work um, done, not done by me, by my uh, colleagues uh, at Columbia. Is, um, this is a very fresh paper that they keep pushing this in, into one shot 12 color imaging on the same set of uh, uh, tissues. Um, and when coupled with optical clearing, um, they could demonstrate this in uh, one centimeter uh, imaging for um, uh, uh, molecular profiling. Um, for us, we are working on the similar lines, but we are taking a slightly different approach. So we are more interested in developing and, and also exploring new spectroscopy from this Raman probes that we are trying to develop a photo switchable and, and photo activatable and, how, and at the same time, highly multiplex Raman, Raman probes that could, could allow us to uh, leverage the um, spatial control by the light to perform uh, light selected multi, multi, uh, multiplex uh, um, uh, optical imaging um, um, and, and tracking. So hopefully in a not so far future, I can show, share with you some of our new work toward this line, but uh, uh, we're still working on that yet. Okay, so I think I'm very good on time. So with that, um, I uh, would like to thank my wonderful group um, and also um, my wonderful, our wonderful collaborators, which uh, I should have listed them here um, and the, the fund support. And also I want to take the advantage of this uh, very popular spatial omics uh, seminar uh, opportunity to say that we are actively recruiting for both uh, graduate students and the postdocs, um, ranging from specialties in opt optics, uh, instrumentation, and to uh, synthetic chemistry and to cellular biology and neurobiology. So if you have any interest to working with us and trying to uh, work together to bring Rama to the next level, please uh, send me an email and we are, I'm happy to discuss more. And we are, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Lou. This is a very, very impressive. Uh, I think of both label Frey and, uh, and uh, Raman labeling, um, it's opened up uh, tremendous opportunities in this space. Um, so I think uh, um, we, we try to keep this forum relatively uh, kind of informal. Uh, whoever want to ask a question, you can just uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. And I see like uh, um, two questions, or uh, one question, one comment. I think in the comment from Suhi, uh, this is amazing. And there's another question in the chat box. Uh, so uh, if you can read, you can read yourself, Lou. Uh, otherwise, I can uh, yeah. read the question for you. Uh, I can do that. So roughly, mm -hmm. how fast is the imaging for a given area or volume? I normally think of Rama as slow, but not sure if that's the case in this config configuration. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it really depends on our signal noise ratio. Um, but on average, on the um, for the images we acquire is uh, about um, anywhere between one second to twenty second per frame. Um, so we do this by uh, raster scanning. So each pixel is about um, a few microseconds per pixel to up to a hundred microseconds per pixel. So if we have very strong Rama signal as we did for the CH3 case and label free case, we can do this by in one one second per frame. And each frame is about 500 micron per 500 micron uh, image. So if we want to generate a mosaic, then that's the number of times that 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 the number of, of 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 mosaic images we want to take. But um, on average, is somewhere between tens of seconds um, for a typical image, and and uh, a couple of minutes um, for a mosaic image. I hope that answers the question. 
Yeah, thanks. That's, that's great. That's good to put it in perspective. But it's a super, uh, super amazing data. That's awesome, irrespective of how, how fast it is. That's cool. Thanks. So um, as we are waiting, maybe I have a quick question. Thank you. I think this was a you know, fascinating uh, data set and, uh, and technology. So can we in the future think about ways to probe RNA or DNA molecules like nucleic acids using this technology? What's your insight on this? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for um, for the for raising this, Ahmed. Um, I think, um, well, of course, one thing we can definitely try to um, push toward is to uh, use this um, higher multiplexicity so that you can do one shot imaging toward um, genomics or transcriptomics uh, measurement. Um, but I think that's actually has been uh, quite well executed by fluorescence, um, right, by the barcoding strategies. I, you are an expert, so you probably have more insights on that. So I, for on my personal opinion, I really think um, the Raman-based multi, highly multiplex would find more utility in protein-based or uh, metabolite-based uh, uh, profiling, uh, molecular profiling, um, which is really hard to implement by the barcoding uh, strategies. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's my five five cents. But um, but I'm 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 happy to to discuss further. Sure. I mean, I'm just curious about multi omics capability, right? Uh, so can you, for instance, incorporate something to RNA, or you know, uh, as the cells or animals are live, and then track them later, such that with one shot you get both RNA and protein, right? That was kind of my. <laughs> That that's a great question. Um, so you want to, yeah, I, I guess yeah. In that case, we you pro we probably can do this like either on time sequence, right, as as a time barcoding, or um, to 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 track different things and then do this at the what a one and end up for one shot. I think that's a definitely something we should think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if you you can combine label free and uh, label uh, the imaging of the target proteins or transcripts, right? Um, maybe you, you need to do this uh, sequential, uh, for example, do a label free RAMA imaging and the same tissue, you just uh, apply the, the 12 different uh, uh, RAMA dye label uh, antibody that you can do protein imaging. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, definitely, uh, that's, a, that's a good thought. Um, okay. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. something. Well, hopefully, I would be very interested to to collaborate mm -hmm. with you on your single single cell transcriptomics technology to 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 fully explore that. Yeah. Uh, also, this reminds me the uh, I think a talk I I listened to like a ten or twelve years ten to eleven years ago I think oh almost twelve years ago that it's a, uh, on a beautiful island. Uh, in Greece, I think uh, Gary Nolan was <laughs> talking about the, um, that, that, that that was before Gary started uh, to work on the CYTOF uh, using mass spec to uh, do multiplex the protein analysis. He was talking about very interesting ideas uh, using solar nanoparticle and some ramen dye uh, to label cells and do multiplex uh, imaging or multiplex the flow cytometry using SIRS. And so I wonder if you can kind of reevaluate the potential of this approach, you know, uh, or any other possibilities there to further enhance your signal using something like a field enhancement, right? Yeah, that's a that that's definitely a great thought. We uh yeah, we got a lot of uh, inspiration from from Gary's um uh, <laughs> work. Um yeah, I think definitely that worth a reevaluation. Um, so that we probably well, there have there have been um work in in our field trying to combine the stimulama enhancement with field enhancement so that we can mm. obtain single molecule sensitivity. Um, I think that would be really powerful if if you can make that work for biological samples. Um, I guess the current the um I may not be on the 
very front of, of, of the field, but uh, of this uh, source field. But uh, I think current the limitation or the obstacle would be how to do this with very high specificity. Um, because mm -hmm. for source, you, well, it's, it's, it's in, a, in a way less quantitative because um, you don't know where you are getting um, the field enhancement from the particle. And mm -hmm. also it's more complicated if you put this into cells. So I think, I, I still think this could be a very powerful way to do it. Um, but as long as we can get high specificity um, figured out for the labeling. Cool. And uh, in the meantime, um, uh, I have a quick question as well, but there's actually a question on the chat. Would you like to read it? From oh, yeah. So to what extent can this technology be used to observe epigenetic events, i.e. looking at histone chromatin? Well, um, um, thanks for the question, John. That's a great question. So I have to be honest that um, currently in this um, small label, label-free approach, the sensitivity is still a, um, a bottleneck. That's why we have been pushing very hard toward the resonance or the Raman dye approach so that we can do um, detection at the nano, nanomolar scale. On the small cell part, we, our detection sensitivity is still limited to micromolar, so which makes it a little bit hard to observe this uh, histone modification um, on chromatins. Um, but that being said, um, we are also trying to um, figure out how to further push the technique into higher sensitivity. Um, so once we have the sensitivity ready, we can do, I, I think this would be something very worth while to look at. Um, and also I got that comments um, as well, um, but, um, but currently I have to say, we are not yet in, in terms of sensitivity um, to observe this uh, epigenetic events, but we are definitely working toward that. Well, at least the whole field is, is working toward that. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, my question is gonna be about uh, labeling strategies, right? So what, what about the uh, histopathology tissues? Can we think about the use of Raman in diagnostics, right? And um, then I have a second question, but let's talk about this one first. <laughs> right, so um, I, well, in, in the case of Raman dye approach, it's, 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 it would be very similar to um, you know, the fluor for approach or, or the uh, mass spec, um, the isotope antibody labeling approach. So it's similar antibody labeling um, scheme. Um, so I think um, the advantage is that we add more uh, plex uh, multiplexicities so we can reduce the wrongs and then do try to do everything in a single shot to reduce any uh, possibility of uh, sample deterioration. Um, so so that's, I guess, on the, on, on the Raman dye approach. Um, on the um, label free or minimum labeling approach that we are trying to get the metabolic information out of it, um, SRS is really great for uh, fresh tissues um, because it's compatible with, with live cell imaging and um, it's relatively fast. So we um, are keeping the, we have, we're quite good at keeping them alive during imaging. Um, um, but, and also the likely uh, fixed samples, we can work with that. Um, currently, the slight issue is on, um, frankly speaking, on the, F, uh, the FF uh, uh, paraffin embedded um, uh, tissues. So the reason is because the resin would also introduce the CH signals in the label free approach, unless we have the carbon deuterium. Uh, signals already um, incorporated, fitted to the to the sample and incorporated into the tissue, then that will be less a, less of an issue. Otherwise, we would have a significant uh, background contribution from the paraffin itself. So that's something uh, we will need to consider if we want to use uh, paraffin embedded tissues. Cool. And so that means the frozen section works, right? The frozen yes, section okay. and uh, you like to fix with PFA, uh, that should be fine. Yes, that, that would work very well. So we have okay. uh, demonstrated this with, with Jim. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
And for labeling approach, right? My second question was, after you label, right, an image, do you have any signal coming from the cell or tissue before it was labeled for the same molecule? Like, is there an endogenous signal versus the label signal? Or do you need to decouple those? I mean, could you help me understand with this? Um, which of Let's say you have an A label, right? And the uh, cell before you label, maybe it has also A molecule inside, right? When you label it, then you, you will have A conjugate plus A, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Then when you image Raman, you might have maybe A plus A conjugate, right? Right. So, um, yeah. So to be quantitative, then um, the easiest way is to just add them together, <laughs> right? So, because uh, when you when we when when we label them in a deuterated way. Um, then we're basically replacing all the hydrogen components with deuterium so that all the newly synthesized molecules have been, or transformed the molecules being tagged by carbon deuterium. Then because carbon deuterium has very similar, um, almost the same uh, cross section to carbon hydrogen, then it's basically new plus pre-existing, then come add them together, that would be, give us quantification. Um, for the, uh, alkyne probe, um, that's, well, that will need a little bit of uh, um, um, calculation for how to transform the alkyne cross sections to the CH cross section for the pre-existing molecules. Um, but what we have been observed is that for um, the alkyne probes, um, because it's still an in, in, uh, ex exogenous probe, so the cells they cannot metabolize, exactly metabolize those probes. That's a contrast carbon deuterium. So if we want to do longer term and more replacement of the uh, metabolic pool, uh, carbon deuterium would be a better choice because it's highly non-toxic. So we have been feeding mouse with this for a couple of weeks um, and they still pretty happily <laughs> there and there. Um, for the, for the, for the, um, for the, uh, Alkyne tool, alkyne probes, they, they're more suited for relatively shorter term, but higher signal, they offer higher Raman signals um, because um, of the high um, uh, electron uh, clouds for the, for the polarizabilities for Raman probes, uh, for the Raman signals there. Um, so I guess to, uh, the, to, the short answer for your question is that, uh, uh, yes, we have the pre-existing and the new, and then we, if we do quantification, we have to add them together to, to do the quantitative analysis. Um, and longer version is that we have to um, carefully select which probe to use in terms of uh, specific applications. Totally, because this is in sight of, right? Uh, they have been characterized to look at the endogenous elemental or isotope signal before labeling. And those channels were used to label, right? Your endogenous should be minimal or none such that your new one or specific one will give you the specific signal. That's right. That's why you want to choose your probe to be bioorthogonal. That's otherwise, true. yeah, otherwise there, there it will be complicated by the endogenous uh, percentage. Great. Thank you. We have also another question in the chat. Is there any limit of to how long and how often you can image live cells over time, photo damage or other toxic effect? Um, thanks a lot for the question. Um, so I guess um, in theory, we try to minimize any photo damage um, effect from the laser. That's why we choose to have a picocycle laser with less um, peak power. Um, and uh, it's more in the near infrared region. So it's more biocompatible. Um, and we also, during any during the experiments, we try to monitor any of the possible toxicity effect um, by just uh, looking at the morphology change and uh, using the those uh, assay kits um, sold by um, I guess the, the companies to monitor their viability. Um, so the longest we have been doing is um, I think probably a few days, um, but then you have to do it a couple of every hours. Um, I think that for that it has been fine. Mm, but longer than that, I have not. I have never tried that. So sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. 
but I think for longer periods and um, unavoidably, we're going to introduce uh, some photo damage because uh, still, you, we, although we're trying to minimize it, but still, we are going to introduce any, you know, when there is any, once you start to observe those, you're going to perturb them, right? So, <laughs> so I, yeah, I think um, the short answer is we can do this probably if we do this every couple of hours, we can do it a, a couple of days. Um, maybe I think three days. Uh, that's what we have tried. Um, but longer than that, we have uh, not really asset for that. Yeah, have, have one uh, just some just as some thought and now really uh, comments or question. So since uh, I think the Raman uh, imaging is so good at uh, imaging the live cells or maybe even living cells in a tissue. Um, I think it's something that's extremely difficult to do in a spatial omic space is can you do a live cell or live tissue, live animal <laughs> multiplex imaging? It sounds like using Rama is possible, right? So can, can, something like you put a intracranial uh, objective uh, lens in, in a mouse brain, you can look at 12 different Raman signal, I think that's, wow, that's transformative. I really think that's super cool. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that is a goal, right? <laughs> that would be the, the really ultimate goal, transformative goal. Um, mm. But as you as, 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 as you also mentioned, then the phototoxicity um, and, and maybe other toxicity might also kick in. So that's the thing. Uh, that will need some take some efforts to do. I think then I think that's that's some definitely something um, um, we and, and and the people in the field would be very interested in pushing the word. Are there any other questions from the audience? If not, I think let's thank to the speaker again. I'm going to use this clapping sign. Thank you, Dr. Wei. I think this was fantastic to see a live spatial omics technology. Well, hopefully we can do do better. <laughs> we will do. We are uh, confident about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, again, mm -hmm. and I hope to see you in person sometime. Of course, we hope to see you guys all as well. And before we conclude, I'd like to also announce that next week we will have Dr. Kelly Stevens from University of Washington. And she's going to talk about multi-scale spatial mapping of topological and molecular cues in human organs. And this will be an exciting one combining tissue engineering with spatialomics. And with this, we'd like to thank everyone for their participation in today's seminar and hope to see you guys next week. Please have a nice weekend. Thanks. Bye. Have a good weekend. Have a great weekend.